The Mystery of the Child Holding a Dove. December 24th, Christmas Eve. Walker Devereaux, famous novelist, is flying home with $5.27 in his pocket. I wonder if Salinger ever went home for Christmas or Kerouac. Mom's going to ask me how the novel's coming, and I'm going to lie and tell her I finished three chapters. Everybody will be there at the airport to meet me. I don't have any presents. Jeez. I don't know. I feel weird. It's not so much that I feel like a failure. It's just what went down at my apartment the other night. It's like the world went out of kilter. It's like I don't trust myself to know anything anymore. I bought Krista a Christmas present. Big mistake. Hey, Krista. Oh, uh, hi, Walker. Hello. Oh, um, hi. I walked into Krista's office at Mr. Piatelli's, and there was this guy crouched down beside Krista's wheelchair, oh, um, kissing her. Hi. Oh, Walker, this is Duncan. Duncan's home for Christmas. Duncan Walker. How do you do? Okay. Have you seen Cape Fear yet, Walker? It's great. You went to see Cape Fear? Well, after dinner. I was just talking to uh, Mr. Piatelli. He was showing me through the garage. It's uh, quite um, picturesque. Reminds me a little of that other De Niro picture. Taxi driver? Yeah. Never heard of it. Duncan works at McGill University in Montreal. You're teaching assistant right now. Classics. It's a little dull. It's a long way from Poncha Street, eh, Krista? You could say that again. It's a long way from Poncha Street, eh, Krista? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. The guy looked like a real dweeb to me, but Krista's eyes were all over him, like he was the greatest thing since... since... I don't know. A professor dressed in a leather bomber jacket, expensive kid skin gloves, and some fancy sissy scarf, and Krista was all dressed up, too. Meanwhile... I'm standing there with her present behind my back. Do you have something behind your back? Uh, um... Merry Christmas. Oh, Walker. Thank you. Yeah. You wrapped it in everything. What's everything? There's a bow and a card. Oh, never mind the card here. No, I'll I got it. If you're not giving me a card, they're not letting me see it. Oh. That's nice. I'll open the present later. Sure, I gotta go. Are you working tonight? <laughs> That's why I'm here. Who can afford time off? Oh, I gotta start my shift. Nice meeting you, Walker. Yeah. Great. In a moment of insanity, I wrote down the L word on the card, and now there she was, all hot for an old boyfriend. Funny thing, when I wrote it down, I didn't even feel it, but as soon as I saw her with the professor, I knew it was true. Walker, are you there? Walker, where are you? Who cares? What? Nothing. I'm on Queen near University. Okay, pick up at 53 Girardi. That's the restaurant. Chinese or Italian? I don't know. I opened up my present. It's beautiful, Walker. Thank you. Okay. I've never seen anything like it with a little dancer and a clock and everything. The dancer goes round when it strikes the hour. Where'd you get it? At the pawn shop below my place. I didn't open it up earlier because I didn't want to do it when Duncan was there. Why not? He seems like such a close friend. He is. I've known Duncan all my life. Great. He's kind of a dink, isn't he? What? No. Looks like one to me. So... Are you going out with him again? I hope so. You make a really cute couple. Walker, how come we've never gone out? We have. You've been up to my room a lot. I mean out. To a restaurant. To a movie. In public. Well, I don't know. Well, maybe you should think about it. What? Krista? Krista! Actually, I had thought about it, and she was wrong. I mean, she was really wrong about me. It wasn't that. It was the same reason I hadn't, well, 
come on to her up at my place. I didn't want her to, to get to depend on me. I mean, I'm supposed to be on the road. I can move out of Toronto like tomorrow. So we get all involved and then I walk away. I was trying to protect her, damn it all. Dampish evening, isn't it? Yeah. Where to? Oh, uh, 28 Dangley Avenue. I believe it's near Shooter and Parliament Streets. Uh, right. <clears throat> I wonder how it got its name. There's no Parliament building on it, is there? Nope. Uh, Queen's Park's over on University Avenue. Yeah. A curious city, Toronto. Queen's Park, King Street, Simcoe, York, Richmond, Victoria. British to the core. And yet, so much of what you see is black and brown and yellow faces. Hmm. Reminds me of London. Oh? Oh, yes. London's quite a melting pot these days, as the Americans say. Except, of course... Everyone refuses to melt. What do you think? Is man meant to live separately, as all the bloodletting around the world would lead one to believe, or are we meant to melt? Well, uh, uh, as far as I know, there's only the one planet, so maybe we should try to get along. Oh, well said. Well said indeed. Forceful, concise. Totally misguided, of course, but well said, nevertheless. Thanks. The man was wearing one of those black wool hats that stick up on your head about a foot and an expensive-looking overcoat. Every time I looked at him in the mirror, he was looking at me in the mirror, an amused, sly expression on his face. He sure was having a good time for someone just taking a cab ride through the slush and damp mist of Toronto. I thought maybe I had a sign, Yokel, taped to the back of my head. There you go. Ah, oh, thank you, driver. Keep the change. Oh, thanks. And take care, as they say in these here parts. <laughs> I pulled out from the curb. Dagley Avenue was a narrow one-way street, a wash and slush, dimly lit, two rows of parked cars, and then... Look out, you dumb bitch! Come back here! All I caught was the dark shadow of this woman, just a few feet in front of me. I stopped. She dodged back, then fell on the other side of the road, started to crawl away. She looked beaten up, her shirt half torn off. Come back here, I'll kill you! I'll kill you! She got back up on her feet, then tried to run along the road, looked back at me, desperate. Get in! Hurry! I left the Weasley-looking guy standing in the middle of the street, waving his fist around, made a turn, got back on Parliament Street, and headed south. I'll uh, put the heat on full blast. You okay? I've got some, um... Here's some Kleenex. Need some Kleenex? I don't know. Here. Got it? I could take you over to St. Mike's. They'd patch you up? No. Oh. Well, um... Where do you want to go? I don't know. Oh. Maybe we should just see how bad it is, okay? I pulled the cab over to the side of the road, put on the interior light. She was still huddled in the corner, then she slowly lifted up her face. Her mouth was swollen on the one side, her eyes dark and smeared, mascara running fumbling with her torn shirt. Then she looked up at me. Well, while I live. Oh, yeah, it's not so bad. <laughs> Terrific. Now turn off the light, will you? Oh, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> like, are you sore anywhere? Bones broken or anything? I'm sore everywhere. I'm sorry, don't worry about it. Yeah. Here. <clears throat> Wear my jacket for now. I don't need it. You sure? Yeah, it, it, it's like a Swedish sauna in here right now. <laughs> what do you know about a Swedish sauna? Oh, I'm from up near Thunder Bay. Mm -hmm. I know everything about a Swedish sauna. Thanks. Big River Chiefs, number 12. Hockey. Huh. We drove around for a while. Her name was Jo. She was about 29, I guess, thin. Angular face, bony shoulders, but pretty too. I mean, really sexy, pretty, in a kind of hungry street corner way. You got a cigarette? Uh, yeah. 
I've, I've got a few rolled. I make my own. Great. Thanks. I used to roll my own, too. So, uh... I could, um... Take you to a friend's? I don't have any. We've only lived here a couple of weeks. Donnie was out of work and... Well, I just got laid off, so... We thought it might be better here. Uh, Donnie... Oh, he's the guy who... Yeah. Most of the time he's okay, you know, but... Well, then he gets drinking and then he gets crazy ideas in his head. He gets jealous for nothing. It's all in his head. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I'm not going back there. He can freeze in hell for all I care. Look, I'm not going back. Uh, look, wh why don't we go in here? We can get a coffee. I'm not going in anywhere looking like this. Well, I'll bring it out. And a donut? Okay. Jelly sender. Honey? Chocolate? <laughs> With this mouth? How am I supposed to eat a donut? Oh. I'll try a coffee. Good. Okay. How old are you, anyway? Not as old as I look, I hope. How old? Uh, 19. Yeah? You're a really nice guy, Walker. <laughs> nah. Listen, you really, really are. Well, the, this is it. I'm just a couple of floors up. You sure it's okay? Me staying at your place. Oh, yeah, I, I live alone. Who's to care? I don't finish my shift until six in the morning. I won't be back till close to seven. Then I'm gone. I promise. We walked up the worn wooden steps, Joe still wearing my jacket, her hand over her swollen mouth, and me following her. Big river chiefs, tight black slacks, snow boots, and thinking that I shouldn't be thinking what I was thinking. After all, Joe had just been beaten up. What a rat, to even think it, but thinking it just the same. Hey, this is nice. It's okay. Yeah, well, it's sort of a bed-sitting room, and it's got a kitchen and its own bathroom. It's not my furniture. It came furnished. Oh, yeah. I'll, um... I'll get you a shirt you can put on. And a sweater. While I rummaged around in the closet, she looked the room over, still holding her hand over the side of her mouth, looking like someone just fished out of a lake. She glanced down at the street from the window. Not much of a view. Oh, church is okay. Yeah. Church Street. Uh, here's a flannel shirt. Thanks. She glanced up at me, her eyes sharp now. Uh, Donnie and me, uh, we've been in the pawn shops a few times along here. Oh, right. And uh, here's an old sweater. Uh, thanks. Uh, where's your washroom down here? Right. Uh, I'll give you your jacket back. She went into the washroom, tossed the jacket out on the floor, and then closed the door. Oh, God, I'm a mess. I I'm going to clean up, Walker. I I'm okay. You can go now. Okay. So, um, there's bedding beside the couch. Yeah, I saw it. Thanks. If you want, it pulls out. I, I can pull it out for you. No, that's okay. I'll, I'll just crash right on the couch. There's some ice in the fridge for your face. Thanks. I'll see you around seven. Right. I went out closed the door loudly, rattled the key around a bit like I was locking it, then hurried down the stairs. Things were turning a little weird, all right, but not the way I had fantasized. Church is okay. She talked. She even handled herself like she'd been living in the city all her life. And there was something else. Earlier, when she was sipping at her coffee like a wounded bird and holding her cheek in her hand, it seemed from what I could see that the swelling had gone down from when I first saw her. I thought, well, that's good. I didn't think anything about it. But now I did. I found her paper coffee cup in the back seat where she left it, jammed against the door. A serviette was balled up and stuffed inside. I pulled it out, opened it up. Inside it, once warm but now half frozen in the cold, was a huge wad of pink chewing gum. I had been scammed. I looked back up at the lighted window in my apartment. What was she up to? Had she planned to rob me, then chickened out, or steal something from my place? My place? 
There was nothing of value up there except my sonny boy Williamson tapes. Maybe she was setting up her boyfriend on a false charge of assault or something. Maybe. And then, there she was at the window looking down at me. I started the cab, pulled out, drove down the street out of her line of sight, and parked. I waited for a minute, got out, walked back, stood in front of my door, listened. Nothing. Silence. I opened the unlocked door slowly, peeked in. I couldn't see her anywhere in the front room, so I moved down the hall, past the washroom. There was an old cracked mirror hanging on two nails above the sink in the kitchen. I was hoping to catch her reflection in it before she caught mine. Only trouble was, the mirror wasn't there. I backed up and out. Joe? Hi. You still up? Yeah. Hi. Hi. I uh, just thought of something, so I came back. I'll be right out. Uh, I'm just getting some ice for my mouth. Right. I thought I might make up a thermos of coffee since I was here anyway. Save myself some money. You sure you don't want the couch pulled out? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. That'd be nice. I pulled the bed out of the couch, threw the bedding on top, then walked down the hall into the kitchen. The mirror was back up on the wall, and Joe was standing at the open fridge, putting a couple of ice cubes into a J-cloth, then pressed it quickly against her cheek. Should do for now, eh? Yeah. Does it hurt? Well, a little. Yeah, it'll go away. Uh, do you want a coffee while I'm at it? No, no I'm just going to crawl into bed now, try and get some sleep. You've been great, though, Walker. Thanks. Okay. I put the kettle on the stove, waited for a minute, then quietly lifted the mirror off the wall and laid it face down on the table. I could see where Joe had pried aside two small finishing nails at the back. Four more to go. I bent them a little with a kitchen knife, then slipped out the cardboard backing. There was nothing between it and the back of the mirror. I turned the piece of cardboard over, thumbtack to it, on the other side was about a two-foot square of yellowing canvas. I pulled out the thumbtacks and turned it over. A child was staring at me, holding a dove. It was an okay painting. She was in a long blue dress. The sky was a deeper blue and the grass was a flat green. Maybe it was a little too precious. Her eyes were framed in long lashes. Her head was held in such a wistful way. And then... I noticed some writing along the black line of paint that separated the sky from the earth. Picasso. Joe? You asleep? <sighs> I'm uh, going now. See you in the morning? Okay. I locked the door this time, went back to the cab and waited. I could almost see her taking down the mirror again, pulling back the nails, taking out the cardboard and finding nothing. And then what? It didn't take long to find out. One cup of coffee and a cigarette later, a car pulled up in front of the building. A man got out. A man wearing an expensive dark suede overcoat and a black wool hat. The kind that stick up about a foot above your head. The Englishman. Walker, are you there now? Hey, Krista. I'm watching this guy with a sheep on his head and a suitcase in his hand go into my building. What? Somebody I know just let him in. What are you talking about? Would you believe Picasso's in my kitchen? Walker, are you on something? What did you take? Walker, what's the matter with you? Nothing. I'm just having a strange night. Yeah, tell me about it. Listen, Walker, I really do like your present. I like it a lot. I like your note, too. I... I love you, too. Oh, jeez. What? Nothing. I'm... I'm glad. Would you call Inspector Kiss? <laughs> Why, did I scare you? No. It's just that I've got his number here somewhere. Um, Tell him to come to my place as soon as he can. 
I think there's trouble. What kind of trouble, Walker? Big time. World class. It seemed to me I sat there waiting for Inspector Kiss for a very long time. Nothing happened at the apartment. No one came running out. No one jumped in the car and drove away. There were three of them. Joe, the English guy, and the weasel who had faked beating up Joe wherever he was now. Three to one. Not very good odds. It felt colder than before. Bits of snow were beginning to stream down through the streetlights, and Church Street both ways was empty. I kept saying to myself, Don't be crazy. Don't be crazy. Stay away. So I walked back, keeping on the far side of the street, thinking maybe I'd just stand in some doorway. Just wait, that's all. That's what I was planning to do, except when I looked up at my apartment window, it was dark. Don't. I'll just turn on the light. No. Joe looked away, blinking in the light. Her hair was combed and pulled back, her face washed clean now, unmarked. She was still wearing my sweater and shirt, though a suitcase full of clothes was sitting open on the bed. She turned to look at me, her face pale except for a rainbow of bright red freckles. Her hand, moving up to shade against the glare, was covered in blood. I walked in a kind of trance down the hallway, turned on the kitchen light. Half underneath the sink, face down, his expensive suede overcoat ripped to pieces, the Englishman, the smiling man lay in a pool of blood. Somebody's butcher knife sticking out of his back. Is he dead yet? Yeah. Good. You, uh, did it? I mean, why? Because he was gonna kill me? Maybe here, maybe later. Somewhere, sometime. What's the matter, Walker? You look funny. I'm okay. So call the cops. I already have. I saw you earlier in the kitchen. The painting. I knew something was up. But the painting was gone. Uh, no, the painting's in the oven. Yeah? <laughs> hey, Ivan, you hear that? It's in the oven. <laughs> you got a cigarette? Uh, sure. Another roller, eh? Yeah. Your hand's shaking. Yeah? It's okay, sweetheart. You want to hear my story? Hey, come on, Walker, sit down. Keep me company. Okay. It was taped to my leg all the time. What? The knife, stupid. Oh. I was ready for him. He thought he was so damn smart, and he bungled everything. He killed my husband. What? Yeah. And we were doing all right, you know, Mike and me. Nothing big but comfortable, professional. Thieves. See, Mike could cut wires and security lines like nobody else. And me? I can talk my way in or around anything. Or anybody, eh, Walker? Yeah. Yeah, so Mr. Big Shot in the kitchen there, he arrives from England. Asks around. People put him on to Mike and me. He's got the score of a lifetime lined up. But he needs some help. An art show in a private gallery, this this painting. Picasso. Yeah. You know how old he was when he painted it? No. Nineteen. And it's supposed to be worth over a couple million dollars. We could get 500,000 U.S. for it easy. That's what Ivan said. He just have to get the word out with some people in London. Three hundred thousand for him, two hundred thousand for Mike and me. So Mike went to London with him to keep his eye on things. Mastermind left the painting here for safekeeping. See, we thought he meant in a vault someplace or a safety deposit box, but he'd rented this place when he was setting up the job. My apartment. Yeah, nobody knew about it. It was, it was a hideout in case something went wrong. And he hid the painting behind the mirror. And he gave the landlord a bunch of post-dated checks to cover the rent. See, the only thing he didn't figure on, in the meantime, the building was sold. The new owner wouldn't take the checks in case they bounced. He changed the locks. He rented the place out to you. 
Joe, what happened? What you were saying about Mike? About Mike. I get a call from Bristol. My husband's been in an accident. A motor car accident, they said. Driving while under the influence. And he's dead. God, Mike was clean. He hadn't had a drink or done drugs in ten years. He, he was the one who cleaned me up, saved my life. He was fanatical about it. Health food and crystals and meditation. He, he was set up, that's all. He was murdered by him. Ivan even called me the same night. Terribly sorry about the accident and all that. I, I just said, yeah, yeah, I, I didn't think I'd ever hear from him or see him again, but he called me. Did I think he was going to cut me out of the deal? Oh, no, never, but there was this spot of trouble, all about locked doors and a young cab driver. Did I think I could help out? Did I think I could get in? It took Ivan three rides in AP cabs until he finally got the right one. And who was the guy, the other one, pretending to beat you up? Sparrow? Just a friend. See, I, I thought maybe if I had the painting, I might run for it. After I'd paid Ivan back. But I just feel empty. Tired. I don't care. It felt good. It felt really good for Mike. Revenge is good, Walker. Inspector Kiss finally arrived, unshaven, grumpy, and he had Sergeant Bendelore in tow. He looked around, and what he said was... You have more fun than anyone I know, kid. Joe, she just sat there staring at the wall, smoking cigarettes, until they took her away. I don't know. It's like the world is out of kilter. I keep thinking of Joe with that knife taped to her leg, smiling at me, leading me along, like a little kid. I don't trust myself to know anything anymore. And Krista, she insults me, she loves me, I don't know. When she heard what happened, she looked real scared, then she gave me hell for going back up there. I know one thing, when I get back, I'm going to take her out to a real nice restaurant and more movies than she can stand. And then, at the right moment, I'm going to say to her, You were wrong. It was only because I didn't want to risk hurting you. And then she'll say, You didn't want to risk hurting yourself. And I'll say, Yeah. We've just heard The Mystery of the Child Holding a Dove, written by series creator James W. Nickel. Featured in the cast were David Ferry as Walker and Jacqueline Samuda as Krista, with special guest Brenda Robbins as Joe. You heard David Hemblin as Ivan the Englishman, with George Booza as Sparrow and Declan Hill as Duncan. Music for the series is composed by Milan Kimlicka, and the casting consultant is Linda Grierson. Our recording engineer is Joanne Anka with sound effects by Matt Wilcott. The production assistant is Nancy Dow. Midnight Cab is produced and directed in Toronto by Bill Howell.